We'll read this this evening from the book of Psalms, Psalm 111 and 112, and then from uh, the epistle of Paul to the Romans, chapter 6, Psalm 111. Let's hear the word of God. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honourable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the works of his, the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of ho have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honour. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And then from the Epistle of Paul to the Romans and chapter 6. Romans and chapter 6. Let's hear God's word. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the de death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace." 
What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you then have in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God bless his word to our hearts tonight. Let's turn tonight to Psalm 112. Psalm 112. It's an interesting psalm. It's what is known as an acrostic psalm, which means that uh, before the psalmist began to write the psalm, he simply wrote down the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and then each line began with a consecutive letter of the alphabet. Um, now, it takes great skill and ability to do that. You could try it when you go home. Write down the uh, English alphabet and then try and compose a, a poem that begins each line beginning with a separate uh, consecutive letter of the alphabet. And you realize how difficult it must be to do and that's what the psalmist is doing here, or he's doing it uh, with the Hebrew alphabet. Actually, Psalm 111 and Psalm 112 are a pair. They're both acrostic psalms. Uh, and I, I don't want to spend a great deal of time on the detail of Psalm 112 uh, tonight. I just want to concentrate on the happy verse. Uh, you remember we're looking at the secret of happiness from the book of Psalms. Uh, some of the, the great things that are described as blessed. Uh, the blessed man, the truly happy man. And after the ho opening hallelujah at the beginning of Psalm 112, we immediately find our text. Blessed or happy is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. So to bring it right down to the heart, to the essence of what we're looking at tonight, happy is the man who delights in the law of God. That's what we're thinking of tonight. Part of the happiness of a Christian is delight in the law, delight in the words of God, just as a, a naturalist might uh, delight in the creative works of God, the works of nature that are infinitely fascinating, so every Christian is delighted with the word of God. It's one of the marks of the new birth, of being a Christian, of being born anew into God's family and kingdom, that we delight in the words of God. Now what I want to do is to try and um, explain this in the light of a popular error that has been around and seen amongst many keen Christians in the past 60 years or so, especially, an error that is that if we're filled with the Spirit, we don't need to worry about the law of God. And then having looked at that, I want us to think about the three marks of the man or the, the woman who spends their time delighting in the law of God. Now, this error... There seems to be a very good case put for this error. It's plausible, it's reasonable, it even sounds and can appear to be spiritual. 
that once we've come to Christ, once we've been born again and by the Spirit entered into new life in Christ, we can then put aside the law of God as something that belonged to the period of our life before conversion. And there are two reasons why people think like that and it's important to understand them and in, in what way they're right and in what way they're wrong. The first is that the law of God cannot justify us. The law of God cannot make me right with God. It cannot bring about my forgiveness uh, and by simply keeping the law of God I can never get to heaven for the very simple reason that I'm unable to keep the law of God. That is something beyond my ability. So just turn over, keep a finger in, in Psalm 112 uh, and turn back to uh, Romans 6 that we read uh, a few moments ago. Romans 6. In Romans 6, 14, there's a very little but important phrase that's repeated in verse 15. And I'm afraid you'll just have to take uh, the phrase without looking at the context. That can be misleading, but I hope you'll just trust me in this tonight that I'm not taking this out of its context. If you don't trust me, well, go home and study it for yourself uh, afterwards. It wouldn't hurt you if you did that anyway. But we read in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Now in this first part of Romans, Paul is talking about justification, and then he goes on to speak about sanctification. And he says, with regard to our justification, we're not under law, but we're under grace. In other words, I cannot be made right with God, I cannot be justified before God by doing what he commands to, uh, me to do, because I'm not able to do what he commands me to do. For example, the first law and the greatest law, the first rule of the law or the road in the Bible that we are commanded, commanded to do, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. Love the Lord your God. That is the law of God. It is not an optional extra for anyone. We are God's creatures and he lays that law on us. We are commanded to do it. Now, can you do that? Can anybody do that? To the contrary, by nature, we don't really love God at all. And even as Christians, there's not a single Christian who would dare stand up and say... By the Spirit of God, I now love the Lord God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. Every day and every minute of every hour of the day, I love God in that way. We can't even do that as Christians. And if any have ever been tempted to say that, it's always been proved either they are psychologically ill or they are just deluding themselves because it is beyond us. Take the second great commandment that Jesus spoke of, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Just, just have a quick look at, at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 for a moment, and verse, verse 43 where Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. I should tell you that that is not what the law of God says. It is only that you shall love your neighbour. But the scribes who taught the law of God at the time of Jesus added and hate your enemy. In other words, as the scribes stood in the pulpits of the synagogues, and taught the law of God, they put that second phrase in to explain the first. And they would say, do you see that the law of God tells you that you're to love your neighbour? Of course, the law isn't so extreme as to tell you 
you should love your enemy, you to love your neighbour, your fellow Jews. But those Gentiles over the border, those awful people, you can hate them, but you must love your, your neighbour. Nowhere does the Bible say that we can hate our enemy. And in Matthew 5, 44, Jesus goes on to explain what the law really means. It means, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Verse 46, for if you love those who love you, I do that, don't you? What reward do you have even greater than the tax collectors? Because they do that. Anybody can see that. But you've got to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, he says in verse 48. Well, we have to be plead guilty because we find it very difficult to love people who hate us, don't we? Who are hostile to us. If we find that there are people who hate us and intensely dislike us, can we say honestly that we find it easy to love them and to pray for them? By nature, we can't, we can't live like that. What about the Tenth Commandment, the one that brought the Apostle Paul to see his particular weakness, you remember? He couldn't stand before the commandment of God that says, you shall not covet your neighbours, this, that and the other, his wife, the TV, the car, the job, the holidays, the good looks, the friends, or anything else that belongs to your neighbour. And Paul, looking at that commandment as a man who was intensely serious about his religious life, who took God's law with complete seriousness and pursued it with real dedication, who did his utmost to keep the law of God as a religious man. He had to say that when it came to the 10th commandment, he was unable to control the desires that he had in his own heart and to stop himself coveting what belonged to his neighbour. Well, we could look at many of the laws of God, but those three serve to show us that when it comes to the law of God, we cannot keep the law of God. And if salvation was ours by keeping the law of God, then we are in a hopeless mess. And you see, we really ought to wake up to that and make that known to people today in our own land, because it's what thousands of people believe in Wales today. They believe that Christianity is all about people trying to get to heaven by doing good things, trying to get to heaven by keeping the law of God, and that we go along to church Sunday by Sunday simply to get whipped up into some excited zeal to keep the law of God, and that if we keep it, we believe we'll go to heaven. That's what most people think Christians believe today. And the first thing people need to learn when they come to church is that they cannot do it. And of course, it's absolutely useless to say, if, I, if, if you keep some of the law of God, that's good enough. Because you know as well as I do, if you overtake a vehicle and cross a zebra crossing at the same time, it's no good saying to the police officer when he pulls you over, but I wasn't speeding, and I've got my MOT sorted out, and I've paid for my insurance, that isn't going to make any difference at all because you've broken the law. So it wouldn't make the slightest diff difference to say, but I keep most laws. And it's no good saying to God, well, I've, I've had a pretty good go at keeping the second and the third commandment, and I'm okay on the fifth, and I'm okay on the seventh and the eighth. That just isn't good enough. So what does the verse say? Romans 6 Verse 14 and 15, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What shall we say then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God, forgive. Uh, God forbid. We're not under law, but under grace, which simply means I'm under the mercy of God. That's where I stand as a Christian. I've gone to God and said, I cannot keep the law of God sufficiently to justify myself so that I might stand in your presence in heaven. And so I come to you to have 
mercy upon me. I'm standing in need of your grace. And unless you have grace and mercy upon me, there's no hope for me at all. And that's all summed up for us in the last verse of Romans chapter 6, verse 23, which is a lovely verse because it encapsulates all of this in one sentence. And if only the people of Wales understood this, because many of them would realise, if they understood this, that they've never really understood the gospel. Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So what I earn for being a sinner, for failing to keep the law of God, for breaking the commandments of God, what do I earn for that? I earn death. And we shall certainly be paid our wages. God never holds wages back from people. But since he does not wish me to die, he offers me instead not the things I've earned, not my wages. He offers me as a free gift, something I can never earn and don't deserve. In great mercy, in his sovereign grace, he offers me eternal life in Jesus Christ. And if you're not sure if you're a Christian tonight, I just want to ask you this question. Have you yet accepted the free gift of God? That's why Jesus says we have to become like little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not because little children are innocent and nice or anything like that at all. Because children are very often not innocent and far from very nice. It's because all children know how to receive a gift without embarrassment. And that is something that adults very often find difficult to do. It's very hard to go into debt to God very hard to humble ourselves before God and to say to him that we realize it's only by his gift that we have acceptance with him and receive salvation. It's only a gracious and merciful gift from God and there's nothing we can bring in our hands but we come with empty hands to him and ask him to give us eternal life in his son. That's the only way anyone becomes a Christian. And if you've never done that, if you've, if you've not receive this gift will go to God now for that without delay and ask him for the gift tonight so as regards God's free salvation it's not under law but it's under grace the law cannot justify me before God secondly the law can't sanctify me Galatians chapter 5 and verse 18 again if you have your bible Galatians chapter 5 and verse 18 if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, says Paul. And then he goes on to say what the Spirit will do. The fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and so on. So we are to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our lives. And if we do so, we are going to grow in holiness. The work, the spirit works from within. So, so it, we, we do not become sanctified, we do not become godly, we do not become Christ-like by keeping the law of God, because still as Christians we're unable to do that. Even when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we fail to keep perfectly the law of God. But the Holy Spirit is the key and the power of growing in Christ-likeness, growing like the Saviour. And what the indwelling Spirit does is first to change our hearts so that we want to keep the law of God. And secondly, to strengthen us so that the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to appear in our lives. But we need to notice from this passage that one of the results of the Holy Spirit coming to live in anyone's heart and life and beginning to live life in the Spirit, is conflict. Look at what he says in verse 17 of Galatians 5. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other. Now we're not to be troubled and dismayed by that. One of the results of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives is that a battle starts. 
And some people get worried about that because they feel, well, surely, now I'm a Christian and the Holy Spirit dwells in me, I should know peace, perfect peace, that there shouldn't be a sense of conflict in me at all. But the reality is that indwelling spirit brings conflict to us. And if there's no sense of conflict in your life over these things, I wonder if you're a Christian at all, if you've ever been born again. If you've been born again, then the Holy Spirit gives you new desires, and your old nature will resist that. So the Holy Spirit will give you a desire to pray, and your flesh will resist it. And there'll be conflict. There'll be a battle in your life over that. Now, if we're not justified by the law, and if we're not sanctified by the law, why then do I need the law as a born-again Christian? Why should I bother with the law of God at all as a child of God? Indeed, when the New Testament uses the word law, it's often used to describe the whole of the Old Testament scriptures. Simply because anything that God says, any statement of God, any promise, any command is always, in that sense, law. Because everything God says is authoritative. Everything God tells us must be obeyed and done. The law, then, is part of the Word of God. And when I'm converted to Christ and the Holy Spirit begins his work in my life, he gives me a desire for the law. And that's one of the most common things that we see in the Old Testament book of Psalms. The psalmist knew what it was to have the Holy Spirit come upon him, and constantly we find him then saying, that he delights in the law of God. Let's just look at one example of that in Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm in, uh, in the book of Psalms. In Psalm 119, we find the psalmist saying in verse 16, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your Lord. You see, God's statutes, God's word, are his delight. He's not going to forget it. He delights in it. Verse 24. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counsellors. That's how he gets guidance. We all get into trouble sometimes over guidance. And often it's because we're not delighting in the law of God. But if the heart and the mind is full of scripture, full of God's word and law we'll find that the ordinary everyday problems of guidance are solved much more quickly and simply. Psalm 119 verse 47. I will delight in your commandments which I love. Now you see, an unregenerate man, a man of the world, can't say that. You can test it. You can go anywhere in the world. Go into any pub in Wales. Go into the Senedd down in Cardiff. Into any office and ask anybody there, do you delight, do you love the law of God? Do you delight in God's commandments? And if anyone there says, yes, I do, in their heart, well then you have met a Christian. But we don't delight in God's law by nature. We are, as we are by birth, we don't de delight in God's law. We have to be born anew. We have to receive a new nature from God, to be born from above by God's Spirit. Now, we are to meditate on the law, and one reason why we meditate then on God's law is because God's law is the objective standard of God, the moral standard. The word for sin in the New Testament, there are three very vivid picture words for sin in the New Testament. One of the words for sin means to miss the mark. Um, sometimes you might have seen on the television these, uh, there was recently the World's Dart Championship. Some people are very skillful, men and women who from a certain distance could just throw a dart and hit a very small mark on the board. And uh, they seem to just hit the mark they're aiming for. And you have a go and I have a go and we're sort of miles off and sometimes we might not even hit the board at all. Missing the mark. That's one of the pictures for sin. 
Another word for sin in the New Testament is falling short of a standard, like failing a test, failing an examination, entering a high jump competition, and failing to reach the entry standard. Another word for sin in the New Testament is trespassing, which means going over a boundary, crossing a line. So those three words for for sin in the New Testament, they each imply in the word that's used something objective, and that's very significant, isn't it? You can't miss a mark if the mark isn't there. You can't fall short of a standard if the standard doesn't exist. You don't trespass if there's no boundary to cross. So as you read the New Testament words for sin, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the objective mark that I can miss? What is the standard I can fall short of? What is the boundary that I can trespass? And the answer is, it's the law of God. It's the will of God. It is the commandments of God, the standard, the mark set down for the, in the Bible for all the moral standard that God has set. If I trespass over those moral standards, then I'm a sinner. If I fall short of that moral standard, I am a sinner in God's sight. If I miss the mark, I aim for them in my life, but I miss them, then I am a sinner. I've fallen short, I've missed the mark, I've crossed the boundary. Now if you take the law away, as some Christians advocate, if you remove that objective reality of the law of God, then the concept of sin disappears. And that's precisely what has happened in our society, hasn't it, in the past 50, 60, 70 years. And because the objective absolute standard of God's law has been dismissed and rejected, the concept of sin disintegrates and evaporates. So what our fathers call sinful is no longer thought to be sinful in society, is it? And as a result, sin increases as the standard of God's law is removed. And so to return to the metaphor I was using earlier, As the standard lowers, so you find people who think that they are athletes because they can jump four inches. And they're deceived because again and again and again, the standard that God has set has been removed and obliterated. You can live on a desert island with a tone-deaf wife, and you might imagine you're singing like Pavarotti as you go around the island singing your lungs out. Because there's no other standard to judge it by. But then you come back to civilization and you find everybody's telling you to shut up. You see, if there's no standard set for us, then we will be completely deceived about our abilities, the things we're able to do, won't we? And that's why the Bible constantly puts before us this objective standard and why Christians go on talking about sin that's why outside of Christianity, where those standards have never been set, nobody gives a fig about sin. And you hear people say, but everybody's doing it. Everybody else is doing it. That's a standard. It's so low, you can hardly see the standard. And that's why if we look at what everybody else is, has done and is doing, and we think that's a standard... We look at ourselves and we think, well, I'm doing okay in comparison. I can pat myself on, my, on the back because I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. But God's standards are not their standards. And the moment I look at God's standards, no matter how good I might be in my eyes, I am humbled because I realize I can't keep God's standards. That's why you and I need the law of God. It does not justify us. It does not bring us to salvation because we are never strong enough to keep the law of God. It does not sanctify us because that's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Nevertheless, the word of God, the law of God is vital because the Holy Spirit takes that law and uses the word of God to feed me, to guide me, to strengthen me, And to show me what God's standard of holiness is. And to remind me of it. 
so that I don't wander off into the wrong path. Now, let, as I close, let me, just, let me just point out from Psalm 111 then three things that will happen as we delight ourselves in the law and the commandments of God. And I'm sure each of these things is something that every believer wants for themselves. Uh, the first is that you'll get to be a little more like Christ by meditating on the law of God. Only a little bit, but it'll be a little more like Christ. Now let me show you this from the psalm. Psalm 111 and Psalm 112 are a pair. They're like twins. Psalm 111 is about God. Psalm 112 is about a godly man. That is, the man who follows and walks in the ways of God. And the psalmist does something astonishingly bold in these two psalms. And sometimes we find then he repeats in Psalm 12 exactly what he says in Psalm 11. So what he says in Psalm 11 about God, he says exactly the same in Psalm 112 about the godly man. That is the man who follows the ways of God. So it's very bold. Sometimes uh, we see this patterning here then. For example, look at, uh, just look at verse 3 in both the Psalms. In Psalm 111, it says that God's righteousness endures forever. We wouldn't dispute that, would we? God's righteousness endures forever. Now look at Psalm 112 and verse 3, where we read, his, that is the godly man, his righteousness endures forever. Isn't that amazingly bold? That the psalmist says that what is true of God can be true of you. It can be true of me. But it can only be true, you see, as you feed yourself upon the Word of God. Only as you live close to God, as you meditate on the Word of God, is it likely that you will become like Him. Look at verse 4 in Psalm 111. It is the Lord who is gracious and merciful. In verse 4 of Psalm 112, it is the believer who is gracious and merciful. There's one place where the New King James doesn't do us any favours by using the capital H in the text for God. It gives the impression there in verse 4 of 112 that it's speaking about God. But it's not a reference to God, it is a reference to the believer that he is gracious and merciful. And that means that if I follow the Lord, who is gracious and merciful, I ought to become gracious and merciful. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 of Psalm 111 says that God provides food to those who fear him, that he's ever mindful of his covenant, and so on. In other words, he's a generous God. And in verse 5 of Psalm 112, a good man deals graciously and lends. You see, as we meditate upon and delight in God's commandments, we grow like him. That's the first thing that happens. Not that it's a sudden experience. That's something that happens over a great deal of time. There's no slick answers. There's no fast track to being like Jesus Christ for anybody. There's no fast track to godliness in the Christian life. But the man who spends his life studying the word of God becomes more and more like the Lord Jesus. Then there's a second blessing that comes with meditating and delighting in the law of God, and that is stability and security. I can't help but get the impression that that's what many people are looking for and need in life today. We desperately need security. We, we hate to feel insecure. Anybody hates to feel insecure, and we can sometimes feel insecure as Christians. Our experience can be like crossing the Alps. It's just up and down, up and down all of the time. But there's a lovely promise here that the person who delights in the law of God becomes more and more steady 
and secured as a person. Look at verse 6, 7 and 8. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. Suddenly evil tidings arrive. Tomorrow morning perhaps. Unexpectedly. And normally those evil tidings might might knock you completely off balance, hit you for six. But this man who delights in the law of God is not, not afraid of evil tidings because his heart is steadfast. He's trusting in the Lord. His heart is established, verse 8. He will not be afraid. And even though there are people who are attacking him, he's steady, he's secure, he's stable. Well, that's something for us to cover. That's something for us to be looking for and searching for, stability. But I want to say again, there's no slick answer and there's no fast track to that. You don't simply find stability by coming to church once a week, by reading the Bible and praying once a week on the Lord's Day. It's as it becomes a daily thing, so that I'm daily coming to the Word of God. I'm daily seeking the face of God that I find that this state, stability and security comes that, that we all long for in life. And these lovely verses will become more and more real to you. You'll not be shaken. You'll not fear evil tidings. You will find your heart being established. And then the third thing here is prosperity and success. Now I was tempted not to, not to deal with this uh, tonight, uh, though... That is what is promised by the psalm. You probably know that the blessings of God in the Old Testament are largely couched in terms of worldly success and prosperity in business and things of that nature. And I don't want to completely rule that out, uh, though you'll know that some people today, many people today, wildly exaggerate that aspect. And they say that Christians today should enjoy immense earthly success and prosperity. The Bible makes it clear to us that that is not so. But it can be. And so as you read, say for example, the diary of John Wesley, uh, he noted during the 18th century revival in which he was a leader that many, many of the converts added in great numbers to the Methodist fellowship groups all over the country. Many of them soon became very prosperous people. And and that, he noted, was because they had become honest, they'd become hardworking, and people could trust them. And sadly, as a result of that, many of them became slack about their spiritual discipline. Well, I think I can play safe tonight and say this, that God does not necessarily make us prosperous and successful, though he's likely to bless us in material ways as we follow him, simply following the commandments. But not in order that we might become proud, but that in order that we might become useful in the community where we live. In other words, God wants his children to play a part in the society in which we live our lives. Just look at verse 2. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright, that is the offspring, the children of the upright will be blessed. Now, Is that a wrong thing for us to desire for our children? It's not wrong to desire that our children should become useful, respected members, strong, happy members of the society in which we live our lives. So it's not wrong to want to be successful. Indeed, the picture of a successful mission uh, merchant is, is a lovely picture in the Bible when he's a righteous man, as we're told in verse 3. And a generous man, verse 5, and a fair man. He's not afraid of evil tidings, though they will come to him in business, but he's not afraid of it because he trusts the Lord. He gives to the poor, verse 9. He's honoured, verse 9. People see in his life qualities and values that ought to be esteemed. Now these are great things. The man who delights in the law of God is the man whom God can trust with success, with promotion, and indeed with wealth. Because it doesn't go to his head and make, make him proud and selfish, but it'll make him a servant of other people, for God's sake. 
So there are the three blessings that Psalm 112 promises to those who meditate upon and delight in the law of God. And if you're a Christian and you want to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ, the law of God will help you do that. And if you want security and stability in your life, the law of God will help you as you meditate upon it and as you're established in your faith. And if you want to become an honoured, respected member uh, of society in your work and in your home, meditate upon the law of God. What's the alternative to doing that? The alternative is spoken of in verse 10. The characteristically wicked man sees the prosperity and the stability of the believer and is made angry. That's typical of evil and of evil people. People get angry when they see Christians setting a standard and he gnashes his teeth and he melts away, says the psalmist, like, a, like an ice cube on a hot day. He melts away. What that is intended to convey to us then is the whole idea that this man's life is transient and futile. And that's what so many of the Greek philosophers and so many modern philosophers and playwrights constantly refer to today, the transience and the futility of life. How it just doesn't seem to add up as they look at life and try to make sense of it. And the Bible says, yes indeed, without God, without a delight in the law of God, you will indeed melt away. Now you might say to me, I just wasn't born with a delight for the law of God. And you know what? You're absolutely right. Nobody is born with a delight for the law of God. Nobody has that desire naturally innate in them. You have to be born again. You have to receive a new nature if you're to have a desire for God's word. You need to become a Christian through faith in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man, happy is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. The Lord bless his word to us.